Okay, greetings once again, BEC 111 students. Uh, we are continuing with our module, and now we are looking at chapter 9, which is leading. Uh, this comes after we have discussed organizing. Uh, so now we're looking at leading. And leading is basically a task. Uh, so we'll be mainly talking about leadership. Let's just see the learning outcomes for this particular chapter. Um, okay, we ought to be in a position to define the term leadership, differentiate between leadership and management, then describe the components of leadership, uh, also looking at the major leadership theories. And on leadership theories, uh, remember this is your tutorial task that you are supposed to complete and submit. So we may not dwell much into this because we will end up uh, discussing your tutorial task before you actually submit it. So this will be discussed mainly when you submit it. Contemporary leadership issues, uh, why managers should understand what motivates their employees' behavior, then also differentiating between groups and teams, and the simple communication model so we'll follow this particular outline where we'll look at introduction then we'll look at the nature of leadership uh, leadership theories in brief then motivation groups and teams in organization we'll also look at communication so as you may have uh, read by now you have noticed that leadership is the most researched and the most controversial topic in management. Lots of authors write about leadership. Lots of authors um, contribute towards uh, leadership theories. So lots of people who write in management, they want to touch on this aspect of leadership. Uh, while there are many definitions of leadership, the contemporary definition of leadership is basically basically defines leadership as a process of influencing employees to work willingly so it's not a matter of forcing people to do something but it's about influencing them to do it willingly so leadership is a process of influencing employees to work willingly towards the achievement of organizational objectives once objectives have been set there is need for someone who will influence people to work willingly, to perform their tasks willingly in order to achieve the set objectives. Managers take the lead to bridge the gap between formulating plans, between the planning process and reaching the plan, reaching goals, where the, the whatever that, that we have been set to be achieved is finally achieved. Uh, leadership and management, some use these two terms interchangeably, but there is a difference. Leadership is not the same with management. Management is actually broader in scope, comprising four management functions, uh, of which leading is just one of them. Remember, there is also planning, there is organizing, and there is controlling in management. So leading is just one aspect of the management of management tasks. Uh, it is also important to realize that not all managers are good leaders. Some people became managers simply because they uh, simply because they managed to occupy management positions. But that doesn't give them the ability to influence people to work willingly, to perform their tasks willingly, which is leadership. Uh, the same also would apply to say not all leaders are good managers. There are also other leaders who are not good managers. So there is need to strike a balance. Actually, it's important to also realize that there are other leaders who do not have management positions, who may actually find their way into organizations, work without any position, but they will be able to influence people. So just imagine how they would influence people 
if they have bad influence. They can actually influence them to do something that may be adverse to the organization. So there is always need to make all leaders good managers and to also make all managers good leaders. So this is the integration of leadership and management where we are saying there is need to actually try and strike a balance to ensure that those that are not those managers that are not good leaders become also good leaders and those leaders that are not good that are not uh, managers they are also given position so that they can influence people in a way that will benefit the organization so there is need to also identify people within our organizations or within organizations who have leadership capabilities who can influence people to work willingly so that you can empower them with positions and they can do what is necessary for the betterment and for the success of the organization. Uh, looking at the components of the leading function, basically there are five components of the leading function and these include authority, power, responsibility, delegation and accountability. We are saying these are essential, they are important for the leading function. If you are to successfully carry out uh, the leading function, you need those components. Authority basically refers to the right of a leader to give commands and to demand action from subordinates. So you cannot lead without authority. It's also difficult to be a manager without authority. Uh, then the other component is that of power, which is the ability to influence uh, people's behavior, the ability to influence other people's behavior. Then we also have responsibility, which basically refers to the obligation to achieve organizational goals by performing required activities. No wonder why we sometimes say people ought to learn to take responsibility, whereby they see it as a duty to do something in order to achieve the goals of the organization. We also have delegation. Delegation is the process of assigning responsibility and authority to achieve for achieving organizational goals, whereby uh, as a top level manager or as a manager, you assign your subordinate um, with some responsibility and also authority so that they can carry on some tasks on your behalf. Remember, once you delegate, you remain responsible. So what you delegate is authority, but you do not really delegate responsibility. You remain responsible uh, for responsible and accountable for that particular task that you have delegated. Then accountability. We are basically saying if you are a leader, you ought to be answerable. Uh, accountability refers to evaluation of how well individuals meet their responsibilities. If once you know what you are supposed to do, you must also know that an evaluation will be done to evaluate on how well you were able to meet those responsibilities. So without authority, managers are unable to manage, initiate or sustain management process. Authority revolves around obtaining the right to demand action from employees and the right to take action. Final authority basically rests with owners or shareholders of the organization. They are the ones who have the final authority in a company or in an organization. Uh, it is also transferred down from owners or stakeholders. So from owners, stakeholders, it flows to top management middle level management, lower level managers, employees, down that way. Then there is also power which we have defined. It's important for us to know that there are different types of what? Of power, um, two main types of power actually, which is position power and personal power. Personal power is the power that is bestowed by followers on a person. It doesn't come with a position. So by the mere fact that some people generally like a person, some people generally think that a pe that particular person is a leader, 
there is a level of power that they may just bestow on that particular person. Then there is also position power, which is power that flows through the chain of command. Power that they derive from a position. Uh, so power uh, ranges from uh, coercive power to expert power. There is what is known as the power continuum. And we need to understand what do we mean by coercive power? What do we mean by reward power, legitimate power, uh, referent power, and expert power? So, in terms of coercive power, this is the power to enforce compliance through fear, whether psychological, emotional, or physical, to say if you do not perform, we will withhold your financial rewards. We will not pay you. If you do not perform, we will beat you, or if you do not perform, we will actually fire you. So it's like you are forcing people uh, to do what you want them to do. That's coercive power, whereby as a leader or as a manager, you coerce people. You force them to do what you want them to do. Then there is what is known as reward power. Reward power is based on the manager's ability to influence employees with some with something that is of value to them. Maybe where you say, once you work and you attain this level of performance, we will give you a bonus. That is reward power. Where you are able to withhold something that is of value, to say if you do not perform, you will not get a bonus. If you achieve this, you get a prize. If you do not, that's it. You will not. So people work in or will be influenced to work uh, for the mere fact that they want to benefit something. Then they know that you can withhold something. Then there is legitimate power. This is power that comes with a position. Uh, legitimate power is power an organization grants to a particular position. So you have a right as a manager. Once you occupy a certain position, there is power that comes with that position, which gives you leg uh, which which gives you that authority to actually exercise power by me the mere fact that you are occupying a certain position in an organization. There is also what is known as referent power, uh, and referent power refers to a manager's personal power or charisma. Uh, whereby you, are, you, 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 you people generally love you, you command respect. You do not need to use a position, you do not need to force them to like you, but naturally you command respect. Then there is also what is known as expert power, uh, and this power is derived by managers through their expertise, skills, experience, knowledge, what they are actually able to do. So it also doesn't come with a position, but it comes with their competencies, with what they are able to do. So you see that uh, we have um, a position, but there are other people who are still able to influence others, be not necessarily because of a position, but because of personal power. Then there's power that also comes with a position. So those two are different and we ought to understand uh, them correctly. Uh, we must also know that um, managers have power, employees may also have power. And in, in an organization, we always ought to strike a balance to ensure that the organization remains in equilibrium. Uh, so there is that issue of interdependence to say subordinates depend on the manager the manager also depends on the subordinates and there is an issue of power there so it, uh, we must always strive to strike a balance okay then coming to leadership theories are uh, there various uh, leadership theories 
this you will see in the tutorial task that you guys are working on uh there is what is uh, known as trait theories which involves the identification and analysis of the traits of strong leaders then there are also behavioral theories which looks at how successful leaders behave differently compared to those that are not successful then we also have contingents contingents theories this attempt to determine the best leadership style for a given situation as we also looked at in chapter 6 uh, contemporary approaches to leadership uh, issues to do with trust uh, this you also see in your tutorial assignment so let me not dwell much on this but it's there also in your textbook i think if you had not yet uh, started on it it's important it's important to realize that this is on page 249 uh, and the theories that are you are also supposed to look at are on page two from page 249 to page 252 we are looking at types of leadership and also imaging approaches to leadership. So both types of leadership, imaging approaches to leadership on page 249 to 252, that forms part of your tutorial assignment that you are supposed to work on. So we will not be explaining it before you guys submit your tutorial assignment. I uh, will move on to motivation. Motivation, we will look at it uh, in detail when we look at uh, what it is, then the theories of motivation and so forth when we are studying human resources management. But for purposes of this chapter, we need to understand that since it is the responsibility of leaders and managers to motivate employees and to make sure to ensure that their subordinates are motivated we also understand what motivation is. So motivation is an inner desire to satisfy an unsatisfied need. It is essential that managers understand what motivates the behavior of their employees. In chapter one, we looked at Maslow's hierarchy of needs and that's one theory of motivation where people are motivated by an unsatisfied need. By understanding what motivates people, a manager can influence their performance uh, in an organization. So performance is basically determined by what an employee is able to do, uh, the level of motivation, and the resources available. So motivation is very, very important. Uh, that inner desire to satisfy an un satisfied need that inner desire to work that's motivation and as a leader as a manager you must understand what gives your subordinates that inner desire that inner desire to do something what gives them that what pushes them to actually have that inner desire to do something willingly without being forced so motivation is linked to leadership because there is an issue or an element of influencing people to willingly do something having that inner desire to do something when we finally look at motivation in human resources management you realize that motivation uh, can actually be internal or external there are internal forces to motivation there are also external forces to motivation which still brings us to the issue of separating management from leadership because some people can be we can force motivation into other people using external forces whereby maybe by withholding resources or by threatening them some people may be motivated that way but in this case uh, we are not yet looking at the theories where we have much debate uh, we must also look, in terms of leadership, there's also need to understand group dynamics 
uh, and team dynamics. So teams and groups, they, these always emerge in an organization. And there is a difference between teams and groups. Uh, you must understand that there are differences between teams and groups. So a group comprises two or more individuals who regularly interact with one another and work for a common purpose. We have uh, both informal groups and formal groups. So groups can be formal that are actually established in an organization, recognized in an organization. They can also be informal, which just emerges people interact, they form groups, which may not be recognized within the proper channels of the organization or within the proper structures of the organization. But those groups will still be existing. Every group is different in terms of structure and characteristics. And they, 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 they differ in terms of size, composition, the norms, cohesiveness, status of people in a group. And some uh, may also differ in terms of leadership. And you must also understand that groups uh in as much as they are important groups can also have some disadvantages in an organization especially informal groups so while there are advantages of informal groups you must also understand that there are disadvantages uh then in terms of teams uh, we have, um, okay, this particular slide differentiates between a work group and a work team. A work group is a unit of two or more people who interact primarily to share information and make decisions that will help each group member perform within their own area of responsibility. Within their own area of responsibility. Whereas in a work team, this comprises a small number of employees with complementary competencies who work together on a project, are committed to a common purpose, and are accountable for performing tasks that contribute to achieving the organization's goals. So in a team, there is that issue of complementing one another, whereas in a group, people work, they gain information, to perform tasks in their own area of responsibility. So that's one of the main differences. Uh, there are different types of teams. They may be self-management, managed work teams, cross-functional teams, problem-solving teams. They come in different uh, forms. But what is important is that an organization's performance and reward system they encourage team effort. As an organization, people ought to complement one another. People ought to work together. So most managers, they encourage people to work as teams, as opposed to groups. Uh, in terms of communication, uh, this is the process whereby information is passed from one person to the other. Uh, so effective communication depends on constant communication between leaders and their employees. Communication is very, very important in leadership. Because for people to, for you to be able to influence people they, to do something, they must have understood what you want them to do. So communication is very, very important. So what you see there on the slide is basically the basic communication model. Uh, where we are saying uh, the sender initiates, so they says they say says a message. Uh, the message is sent through the channel, and it must reach the receiver. It must reach the receiver. The receiver can also send feedback, and that feedback must reach the sender so that the communication process continues. And in leadership, communication ought to be two-way. Not to say managers or leaders only ought to be communicating with subordinates. 
subordinates also ought to be communicating with the leaders. So communication ought to be kept as a two-way process in leadership. Uh, that is it with leading. Uh, remember to do your tutorial task in this chapter because that particular task is very, very important for you. Thank you.